I am happy to be here. As the law students here know that uh, there's a Pulse Valley Transactional Center here at the, for, at the school. Uh, I'm a graduate of this school and I am a lawyer with Pulse Valley, which kind of explains all that. Um, I happen to be a litigator, and so I don't know why I'm here speaking on behalf of transactional lawyers, but here I am. <laughs> but what I'm really here to do is to introduce very briefly Derek Schmidt. You all here in Kansas know Attorney General Schmidt. He is in his third term as our Attorney General. And in case you are wondering, Kansas? Antitrust law? Really? I think you'll be surprised. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> it. Well, I like that opening because it leaves things wide open. You'll be surprised. Good. So I had a meeting this morning over at the office with a group of out-of-state attorneys who were in Kansas today talking about interstate water law. They are here. They represented Kansas in a variety of litigation against Nebraska and Colorado on, on water law for three decades now. And they're here really just visiting, but their excuse uh, is that they're talking with a group of students at Washburn Law this afternoon about interstate water law, and their comment to me was, we got a heavy load to carry talking about water law at 3 o'clock on a, uh, on a uh, Friday afternoon, to which my rebuttal, because <laughs> yeah. I've got antitrust in the afternoon. Uh, You're getting better into that deal. Right? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I know water law. Uh, but thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it from the journal, uh, Mr. Hosel, and, uh, and all of you for being here. So uh, let me frame things up just a little bit uh, and quickly also uh, introduce somebody who's been with you all day, Lynette Baker, raise your hand, Lynette, is uh, one of our assistant attorneys general. Lynette is our expert on antitrust law at the Kansas Attorney General's office. She's served in that role for as long as I've been there, which is, I'm in year nine now, and she predates me on that. So unlike me, Lynette actually uh, has tremendous substantive knowledge on <coughs> antitrust law, uh, both federal and state. My knowledge is somewhat different. Uh, I spent a year, and only a year, in fact it was slightly short of 12 months, as an assistant in the Kansas Attorney General's office back at the end of the 1990s, when I was in the Consumer Protection Division, and among a very broad portfolio, had assigned to me uh, antitrust enforcement. Now if you are a maybe three years out of law school individual who at that point had never been in a case, in a case prior to that job, whose portfolio includes half a dozen different consumer-related statutes, including antitrust, and you're in an office that didn't have overly aggressive antitrust work at the time. And when we did, it was, for example, the Microsoft case, which was well above my pay grade. It was handled by the senior attorneys in the office. Uh, you can imagine that my exposure to antitrust law in that year was perhaps less profound than what you all are focused on in a more academic or self-selected setting. I tell you that because it's relevant to the story I plan to tell you here. What you're going to hear over the next uh, period of time that we're together is the following. Uh, grateful for the invitation to be here. Part of uh, presenting in a journal sponsored event is a pledge to publish. Uh, I'm not perhaps the world's greatest scholar on antitrust, and even more importantly, uh, it's not the thing I spend most of my time on, so Lynette has kindly volunteered, volunteered to uh, co-author with me a piece we will submit to the Journal for Publication later on. What you're going to hear today uh, is just some sharing of a few themes that we plan to have uh, in what we ultimately submit, some of which will make it into the final print version, some of which won't. Um, in that spirit, uh, there really are, I think, sort of three major categories of things I wanted to share with you today. Number one, uh, we'll talk just a very little bit about uh, the history of Kansas antitrust law in particular. Uh, Kansas has a really very rich history in antitrust law. We're the first state in the union to have uh, to enact a state level generally applicable uh, antitrust statute in I think it was 1889, uh, right at the start of the populist era. If you know your Kansas history, you know the 1890s were quite a populist time. Uh, in Kansas, we had, I think it was two, if I'm not mistaken, might have been three governors who were members of the Populist Party, the Prairie Party, uh, in the 1890s, and that's not coincidental. It was a time of suspicion of all things big and uh, driven by the, sort of the frontier mentality, uh, 
uh, and that was reflected in public policy of the day with the early antitrust laws. There were a lot of enactments for Kansas antitrust law at the state level uh, from 1889 through the 1890s, and really a handful continued on through the Teddy Roosevelt period in the early 20th century. Kansas was part of the trust busting uh, uh, sort of narrative, if you will. Uh, and then in about 1923, things stopped. We didn't really see further amendments to the major Kansas antitrust basket of statutes. And I phrase it that way because up until the year 2000, we didn't have a single main antitrust law in Kansas. We had lots of little eclectic uh, enactments that had come over a period of time that the revisers of statutes, the legislative attorneys who put things together and turned uh, passed bills, approved bills into codified statutes, had codified all in generally the same areas of the statutes. Uh, in modern parlance, it's the first part of chapter 50 in the Kansas statutes. Uh, pretty much everything that comes before the Consumer Protection Act uh, is, is part of the antitrust enactment. But it wasn't one seamless statute which is relevant to the narrative. So we had this long gap from 1923 until the year 2000. Um, and that's where our story today picks up. So I already shared with you that in the late 90s, it was literally 1999, I spent my one year of duty in the Kansas Attorney General's office where I became uh, what passed for an expert on Kansas antitrust law at the time. Uh, and in the spring of 2000, uh, I left the Attorney General's office and went to the Governor's office. So Bill Graves was the Governor of Kansas at the time. There are somewhat interesting, not for our purposes today, reasons that I wound up going over. I only worked for the Governor's office about five months from maybe six, from December of uh, 1999 through May of, uh, of 2000. But that was through the middle, entirely really, of the 2000 legislative session. And in my portfolio for that short period of time were agriculture issues. That's why the governor asked me to come over and, and work. And so I did. At that particular moment in Kansas history, for reasons that are for historians, not lawyers, to explore, uh, there was sort of what I'm going to call a nouveau populist interest in all things big in Kansas agriculture. There was a very strong movement. It's always been there, but from time to time it sort of percolates up. There was a very strong movement in the spring of 2000 uh, to enact in Kansas some version or versions of either the Federal Packers and Stockyards Act or other federal antitrust statutes driven predominantly by a discontent among some factors factions in the uh, beef production industry predominantly, livestock were dealing with beef in particular, who were very unhappy with some marketplace developments. And essentially, this is oversimplifying, but you had two big strains in the Kansas beef industry. You had the strain that says we've got to change our marketing practices in order to squeeze more value out of every dollar of sale. Those are the folks that wanted to uh, vertically integrate their operations much more tightly so that you had the same folks owning uh, the cow-cow operation, they were owning the genetics operation, they were owning the feeder operation, and they were owning the marketing on the back end, completely vertically integrated. Uh, U.S. Premium Beef is the premier company in that, they're still in business today, but at the time they were sort of a cutting edge novelty in Kansas uh, livestock production. That's group one. Then you had group two. I'll call them the more traditionalists, uh, they wouldn't call themselves that. But they essentially were very disconcerted by this notion of a more integrated uh, production chain in the beef industry. They much preferred what they viewed as the more traditional model, which is independent cow-calf operator, grows sort of in prairie liberty, um, uh, group of calves every year, and takes them to the local sale barn and offers them for sale in what they argue needs to be a free and robust marketplace <coughs> to buy my cattle. They didn't want to engage in integrated marketing um, and you know, selling, selling an animal before it was conceived uh, uh, because you're going from the genetics on. Two very different views of what the beef industry ought to look like in Kansas. And the reason I tell you all of this is it was a hell of a fight. It was a really visceral political fight. So I've been in this job with the governor now for maybe six weeks in early 2000. The legislative session has convened. This fight is all over the front pages. It's spilled into the governor's office. It's in the legislature. You've got all these proposals, mostly from the more traditionalist faction, to want to enact a whole bunch of new statutes in Kansas to make it more difficult to more completely vertically integrate uh, beef production in Kansas. 
And you got guys in the, the I call them more progressive wing, that are saying, don't be enacting that stuff. We're trying to maximize our profits for Kansas as a producer here in the global marketplace. Leave us alone. Don't stop us from doing that. And you've got policymakers stuck in the middle. So the governor calls me in about six weeks into this job and says, uh, there you have the ideas. And at that point, I drew upon my one year of expertise as a very junior antitrust lawyer in Kansas. And I said, you know, Governor, the only idea I've got is this. I learned a lot about our state's consumer protection law during my year. And I learned, I think it's a pretty modern and fairly effective statute. And I learned a little about our state's antitrust laws in that year. And I think they are neither. They are not modern, and they are not very efficient or effective. So, you know, if you're asking me, come up with an idea to do, how about we come up with a bill instead of layering something new on top of an amalgam of individual enactments that, you know, over uh, the populist period back through 1923, instead of layering yet something else on top, why don't we come up with something that proposes to integrate all of those very old statutes, modernize them, give us tools in the antitrust context that look like the enforcement tools we have in the consumer protection context, get rid of a bunch of provisions that Frankly, nobody's used for 100 years because you know, it was a crime for a county, it was a crime for a county prosecutor not to bring an antitrust action. Think about that. It was a crime for a prosecutor not to bring an antitrust action. That, that can't possibly be a statute that uh, we're going to use in, you know, in the modern era. Um, and the governor said, great, go for it. In hindsight, I'm sure he said that because nobody had a better idea, not because they thought this idea was great, but nonetheless, he said, go for it. And it was a result of that. Uh, we drafted what ultimately became the 2000 amendments to the Kansas Antitrust Laws. It was House Bill 2855. It was the first major, it was the first, it was the only amendments, but it was the first major amendments since 1923. Uh, 2855 did everything I just described. Uh, there was no grand academic plan in creating House Bill 2855 for the 2000 legislative session. There was the story I just told you. There was me with Westlaw in a room talking to two or three representatives of major agricultural organizations and saying, if we do this, does it cause you any concern? Yes or no, I'm trying to figure out my boundaries. And we came up with a pretty comprehensive bill. Uh, it did the types of things I just described. It gave us, for example, administrative enforcement authority for the Kansas Attorney General's Office, which we didn't have before. We had um, sort of a different derivative of, of inquisition authority. Uh, but we still have Inquisition authority, I think it's Chapter 22, generically, but we had this very specific type of authority in the antitrust that nobody had used for a very long time because it didn't make no sense. Uh, we had a bunch of criminal provisions, both peculiar ones, like uh, making it a crime for a county attorney not to prosecute, by the way, it's also a crime for a law enforcement officer not to arrest a person who's violating the antitrust laws. Out of the populist era in the 1890s, that was, uh, that was how things came. But there were also criminal provisions related to antitrust activity itself. We proposed to repeal all of that. Our theory was in modern parlance, antitrust is a civil fight, at least at the state level. We certainly are not going to go arrest somebody for violating the antitrust <laughs> laws. And it makes no sense to have these provisions on the books and sort of distracting um, you know, what we're looking at. Uh, we harmonized the penalty options and created a single <coughs> menu of penalties available to a, a, a court. Um, after there's a finding a violation of the antitrust statutes. Before that, we had this very eclectic amalgam of penalties that were specific to individual sections of the statutes. So a penalty of, you know, $100 to $500 per violation for this statute, a penalty of $50 for a violation of this statute, an injunction for a violation of this statute. We got rid of all of those individual penalties. Got one menu that a court can draw from based on, you know, showing or findings in an individual case. Again, looking much more like Consumer Protection Act or you know, something like that. We put all of these eclectic statutory enactments into a single statute and named it the Kansas Restrained Trade Act, which is now the name of the main antitrust statute in Kansas, and made clear that they are all part of the, the same enactment. They hadn't been before, they were, they were all over the books. And the reason that mattered was some of them had their own enforcement mechanisms, procedural mechanisms written into the statute. So you at least arguably had, if you were enforcing this section of statute, a certain set of processes one was supposed to follow, 
But if you're enforcing this section of the statute, it's a different set of procedures one was supposed to follow. We got rid of all that stuff, put them under one umbrella, so it's under Chapter 60, which is the General Civil uh, Procedure Code in Kansas. Basically, we modernized the law uh, and proposed, uh, and ultimately did, to repeal, I think it was 30 or 40 some sections, a bunch of sections uh, of outdated provisions. That is how we got what is today the Kansas Restraint Trade Act. Uh, and it, you know, it was a fundamental shift in the structure of Kansas antitrust law, not because of any sort of grand thinking through, but because of the reasons I just described. We needed to do something, and that's what we did. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, among the practitioner community, uh, there, was, there was great interest in what we've just done. Uh, I'm sure we did a few things that in hindsight uh, you know, had unintended consequences, and that's fine, that's the nature of it. Um, but since then, we've seen you know, quite a bit of, of uh, <clears throat> evolution in how antitrust enforcement is dealt with in Kansas, perhaps because of the new statute, or maybe just because of changed times. So that's history section number one. Section number two that I want to talk a little bit about then is some of that enforcement history. Um, hopefully by the time we submit for publication, we'll be talking since the 2000 enactments, but today I'm going to talk since about 2011, since that's how long I've served in this office. And I have, uh, I have memory in the gray matter as well as paper research uh, uh, on what the AG's office has done for enforcement. Under Kansas law, enforcement of the antitrust statute, the Restraint of Trade Act, can be accomplished by two different sets of players. Number one, the Kansas Attorney General who's the only entity on behalf of the state or a public entity that can bring an enforcement action. That's different, by the way, than it was before 2000 when you had the Attorney General plus every county or district attorney in the state who had the ability to bring an enforcement action. That's no longer true. The AG now has exclusive jurisdiction to bring a public side enforcement action under Kansas law. Uh, but you also still have private causes of action. And so you get two baskets of enforcement in the post-2000 era. You get public uh, enforcement actions by the Attorney General's office, and you get private cases uh, bringing them. If you do a quick Westlaw search, you'll find there have been quite a number of private uh, cases brought under the Kansas Restraint of Trade Act since 2000. I have no plans to talk about them today because I haven't digested them yet. They usually are on my radar screen, and but for uh, today's gathering, I would never look them up because they just don't cross our radar screen at the AG's office. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about the public side enforcement actions uh, that we brought. Uh, at least since 2010. So, uh, in that spirit, uh, I'm thinking which one we do this in. Yeah, I'll talk about those and then skip that. Uh, we brought around a dozen give or take uh, AG enforcement actions since about 2010. So on our watch, uh, about a dozen give or take. It depends on how you count a couple of these. They fall into a handful of categories. We have several we brought against pharmaceutical entities. I'll list those in just a moment. We have a handful we brought against financial entities. I'll list those in a moment. We have a little cluster that we brought against uh, some of the ebook uh, distributors, uh, Apple and some of the other distributors as uh, price fixing theory. Uh, we have a cluster that um, uh, are merger related cases. Uh, two that we actually filed, uh, and one where we filed comments uh, in a federal review, but we didn't actually file state litigation. <clears throat> All related to telecoms, perhaps not surprisingly, since Sprint is, I believe, still the largest private employer in the state of Kansas, we have a particular interest in the future of the telecom industry in Kansas, not only on the consumer side, although we have that, but also on the job side, since we have 6,000 Kansans who owe their livelihood uh, to, uh, to Sprint currently, give or take. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, what you know may be the reason I'm actually here today, the uh, fairly high profile, although I can't talk much about uh, tech industry investigations, Google, and we haven't confirmed whether we're part of Facebook or not. So, Google and something else. Uh, so, uh, let me share with you kind of what we have on that front. On the pharmaceutical side, uh, we have at least four cases or pairings of cases uh, that we have brought, uh, some are currently pending, some are done. I'll just kind of give you an overview of what those are so you have a sense of how we've used the statute, uh, Kansas statute, on our watch. By the way, in some of these, most if not all of these are multi-state cases. That shouldn't be surprising. The scope of resources that the Kansas AG's office has for this is Lynette and me. And uh, we both have other stuff in our portfolio, and so uh, 
it is unlikely, I think, that, uh, for example, we're going to march out and sue, let's just say, Google uh, on our own with, uh, you know, Lynette and me part-time working on that case. It would be a resource imbalance issue. So it's not surprising in the state AG enforcement community that you see multi-states joining together uh, in investigations and enforcement actions in the antitrust world. It's also not terribly surprising that in some but not all of these cases, uh, particularly where our interests we think are aligned with the United States interests, that you see uh, partnerships between federal enforcers and state enforcers. You don't always see that because our interests aren't always aligned, but sometimes you do and it's common. Um, and so when that happens, it is, it is particularly uh, common that the causes of action will not only be under state law, but also under uh, whatever applicable federal law there may be, some of which give states uh, unique standing or cause of action, some of which don't. But if you've got the United States in, in the discussion, it doesn't really matter uh, at the end of the day. So while I'm going to talk about it from a state law perspective, very few of these are uniquely um, state actions in terms of of assessing liability, and I think none of them will be exclusively Kansas actions. If they are, I'll point it out when we get there. Maybe the merger case. So, uh, on the pharmaceutical side, uh, probably the largest one that we've—it's uh, still a pending case, so I'll just kind of lay it out and leave it there. But we joined with a group of states uh, a handful of years ago and filed suit in what was originally Connecticut, we've now been MDL uh, to the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, which I think is in Philadelphia, isn't it? Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Um, so we've now been pulled into multi-district uh, litigation in the eastern in Philadelphia. Uh, but we sued initially uh, a small number of generic drug companies, and we've now uh, amended the complaint and added in a larger group uh, of manufacturers. Essentially, the allegations boil down to um, what we allege is unlawful anti-competitive uh, conduct aimed at extending the profitability of uh, uh, you know, certain drugs in the marketplace to the detriment of others. Not a terribly surprising theory. Um, I will tell you, and I, I, I think this is secret. Um, I think it's been published. If not, you know, get it here first. Um, this came actually. This case actually came about on the state side because of Connecticut. That certainly is not secret. But I will tell you the reason it came to Connecticut's attention is because they had a very smart antitrust lawyer who read the New York Times one. I know this because he told me the story. He read the New York Times some coverage about a generic drug, um, and it was one of those human interest stories that talks about a particular individual who was having trouble paying for the drug bills. The point of the story had nothing to do with antitrust. Nothing to do with antitrust. It was all about a person who was having trouble paying the drug bills. The smart antitrust lawyer read that article and reading between the lines said, man, it sounds like the conduct that caused this problem is <coughs> anti-competitive, perhaps unlawful. That was the origin of the Connecticut investigation, which now I believe uh, are all 50 states in that. I think that's great. Not we're very close. We may not be quite at 50, uh, but it's very close. It's certainly in the mid to high 40s. Kansas is among them. Um, we continue to litigate the case. Uh, we'll see. We've turned a, a handful of uh, executives in that case. Uh, we've settled with them in exchange for their truthful testimony. So we'll see. Uh, you know where that all leads us, but it appears to be a fairly consequential uh, action. Uh, and we'll go from there. That's the generic drugs case. We also have still pending a second uh, drug case uh, regarding the uh, drug Suboxone, which is a, uh, a word for I never remember it. It's a it's a treatment for opioid overdoses, but there's a word right for that that I can never remember. Uh, and our allegation there is essentially that the manufacturers of uh, this particular opioid treatment drug engaged in conduct designed to keep its price high even after uh, generic competitors would have entered the market. Um, I think what they did was unlawful, perhaps not surprisingly they disagree. We'll ultimately have a finder of facts sorted out. We've been litigating that for a handful of years now. Um, and, you know, when we actually started that litigation, it was before the so-called opioid epidemic was in the news every day. Uh, now it is, and so uh, I suppose we look uh, prescient in having been out in front uh, trying to drive down the price and therefore drive up the availability, affordability um, of uh, uh, drugs designed to treat uh, opioid overdoses. 
Third one is litigation against uh, a company that was man manufacturing uh, and distributing uh, Provigil, which uh, deals with narcolepsy. Uh, I am not a drug person. I am not good at pronouncing a lot of these names. I can say Provigil, and I can say narcolepsy, and I can say antitrust, and that's really all I have to be able to do in order to uh, uh, play my role in all of this. We've actually ultimately uh, reached resolution uh, in this case. It is done. The uh, state of Kansas recovered about $1.6 million, mostly for our Medicaid program, um, because of the anti-competitive conduct of the folks who were marketing this particular drug. Uh, and in addition to that, another several hundred thousand dollars for private purchasers uh, in Kansas who overpaid as a result of uh, the company's anti-competitive conduct. And then the third, the final one, I'm just going to mention, it actually ended right before I started serving in this office, but it was still a live case when I got there. So I will mention it and only mention it. But it was the same sort of litigation against the uh, manufacturers, Apple Laboratory was the main one, of uh, Tricor, which is a, a triglyceride and cholesterol management drug. And enough said about that. So we've deployed the statute in its modern form uh, at least that many times um, uh, with respect to drug companies. Secondly, uh, we deployed it at least twice, actually multiple times for multiple defendants, but two baskets of, of enforcement actions with respect to uh, uh, finance sector. The first, we participated with a number of other states in litigation uh, uh, regarding the municipal bond market. Um, I can pronounce municipal bonds much more readily than I can the name of some of the pharmaceuticals, but once again, we've now closely reached the limits of my knowledge of the financial market. We have the dean over here. He's our financial guy. He can tell us all about bonds and tax-free and all that kind of stuff. I don't know about that. All I know is these guys did stuff they should not have done in terms of the way they manipulated some of the purchasing arrangements in uh, the bond marketplace. And we were able to recover a chunk of money on behalf of the Kansas taxpayers. The, the, the victims in Kansas were municipalities. They were public entities. So the recovery went back into public treasuries. For the most part, not the state treasury. It was uh, uh, local units of government. And the ultimate recovery in that was in the range of a million dollars that we got back and put back in the public treasury um, as a result of uh, enforcement action, a series of enforcement actions that had to do with um, the use of our antitrust statute. Spinning out of that, we wound up participating in the other financial-related um, enforcement action uh, post restraint of Trade Act uh, that has to do with the financial sector. Uh, we were among the states that uh, were litigating uh, over the well, I know, uh, London Interbank offer rate. Uh, this was a big international deal. If you were following international news coverage, it was huge. It involved criminal investigations, prosecutions, and convictions both here and in Europe, and maybe elsewhere, but I'm aware of here and in Europe. We weren't part of that. Uh, we were part of sort of the back end effect of, as a consequence of all of this unlawful manipulation uh, of that marketplace, there were extra costs incurred by entities in Kansas, and we would like to recover that cost on behalf of Kansans. Thank you very much. Uh, we were able to do that, uh, and ultimately recover. What a huge recovery! I think uh, uh, our total to date is a couple hundred thousand dollars, but we have—we're uh, not done yet. We have a handful of those that are still pending, so we'll see how that all goes. Uh, that's the second category: financial cases. Uh, the third category were what I call the e-books cases. Uh, basically, the allegation there was that uh, a group of ebook distributors uh, got together with Apple um, and um, essentially agreed not to uh, lower their prices beyond a certain amount um, uh, in the competition between Apple and I believe it was, uh, what was the other major platform that they were competing against. Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Thank you very much. Um, and Kindle, right? Amazon's Kindle. Yeah. Do I have that right? Anyway, Amazon, doesn't matter. Um, uh, they agreed to extinguish the competition between the two major sellers of ebooks by uh, declining <laughs> to allow a lower rate uh, sale on the Apple platform. Uh, that's unlawful, uh, at least in Kansas. And uh, uh, most of those companies wound up settling with us. Uh, Apple didn't. We actually wound up litigating with Apple with a group of other states again. It wouldn't be something we'd be resourced to handle on our own. Um, and we won that case uh, in federal district court in New York, if memory serves me. Uh, we won it on appeal in the Second Circuit, and then uh, certiorari was denied. So uh, ultimately, we were able to settle out the damages and didn't have to uh, 
sort of do a second stage trial to figure out damages amounts. And we got a chunk of money back for Kansas. It was a seven figure recovery, seven digit uh, recovery as I recall. Um, and most of that, some of those penalties that went into the state treasury and repaid our cost of litigation, but the bulk of it was uh, refunds or credits to people who bought ebooks. So if you were an ebook purchaser, you may have gotten a notice, uh, it's probably been three, four, five years ago now, uh, from uh, Apple or from one of these companies that uh, you've got a credit now in your account, that's why you got it. Uh, if you're in Kansas, you got it because of us. If you're elsewhere, you got it because of our partners. Uh, but that's why you got it. Uh, and that was the type of anti competitive uh, uh, use, uh, deal of anti competitive practices that we made use of the Restraint of Trade Act. Uh, I will say the evidence was really good in that case. I looked at some of the uh, uh, emails and text messages. I was telling my kids, you know, it's the 21st century, none of this stuff ever dies. You write it down today, unless there's a statute of limitations, it's following you forever. And that is true. Uh, and some of them were really, really good. So if you ever get a chance, Google that, although Google's a whole different story. Um, and uh, uh, I think some of those are posted online. A fourth category that we've used the statute for. Um, are the mergers. Uh, I want to mention just two of those in particular. Uh, the first one I inherited when I uh, started serving in this office in January of 2011. It was near its end. We reached final resolution in April of that year. Uh, so the heavy lifting had already been done. But that was the Kansas AG office review of the merger of um, uh, uh, Verizon and Altel. Um, ultimately, we wound up uh, entering into a settlement agreement with the companies that allowed the merger to proceed, but did require them to divest certain holdings in mostly the western part of Kansas to ensure they didn't have too much market concentration in certain specific marketplaces, uh, and that was accomplished. The other one uh, is still pending. Uh, that's the Sprint T-Mobile merger, uh, obviously a big deal. Uh, Kansas was one of the states that uh, originally joined with uh, the U.S. Department of Justice when they filed uh, just a handful of months ago now their petition to uh, and proposed settlement to approve the merger. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at this one, and uh, as I've already alluded to, it's because Kansas has multiple interests in this subject matter, and you know, as a public official, you want to weigh all of the interests. Uh, you don't have perhaps the luxury of weighing only some of the interests. And I trust law looks at some of the interests. It doesn't look at all of the interests. And so uh, we spent a lot of time on this. In fact, I remember one evening uh, sitting on the edge of my bed. It, it was 1.30 in the morning. Uh, and I had the head of the Department of Justice and I trust division on the phone. And I had the vice president for T-Mobile in Seattle on the phone, which is why in the middle of the country it was 1.30 in the morning. Uh, and we were talking through um, matters related to Kansas participation uh, in this particular there are now, I believe it is the case, approximately 10, is that fair Lydia? Approximately 10 uh, states that have signed up uh, and are, are supporting uh, the merger. There's another group of states led by New York who remain strongly opposed to the merger. They filed a separate lawsuit challenging it. Uh, last I checked, it was calendared for trial in, I believe, January, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, and we'll see you know, how that all shakes out. One of those cases uh, does happen from time to time where we do have multi-state groups working together, but not all states are on the same page. So we have two multi-state groups working uh, on opposite sides of this antitrust question, and we'll see, you know, ultimately where it ends up. Uh, we also, those are the only two we filed, actions we filed related to mergers on my watch, but we have uh, participated in at least one more. That was the proposed uh, AT&T T-Mobile merger a handful of years ago. We never did actually file anything in that case in terms of filing in court, but we did file comments uh, in some of the federal regulatory actions. Uh, so, you know, count it, don't count it. Uh, 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 I that as it is. And then the final uh, category I might mention are the tech issues. There's not a lot I can say there. I've already talked about uh, 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 Google investigation. It's gotten lots of press, uh, I believe. <coughs> Uh, if not every state is involved, it's darn near every state that's involved in that investigation. It's uh, predominantly uh, Texas-led, and uh, uh, Nebraska has also been very active in the leadership of that group. And uh, Kansas is a participant in that. We're generally looking at uh, the company's uh, advertising practices and access to their platform practices. I'll leave it at that. We'll see where it goes. Uh, with respect to Facebook, you know, the headlines everywhere. I think there are 48 states and territories now. Um, Kansas hasn't 
firm publicly whether we're one of them, and Georgia said they aren't, and if you do the math and there are 48 in, and Georgia's one that's not, you can see where the odds are. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it with you at that. Um, but it's the same type of review. Uh, New York's a leading state on that. Uh, and again, we're looking at whether the practices, particularly on the advertising side, but not exclusively, uh, violate the state or federal antitrust law, or perhaps some consumer laws uh, along the way. Those are the applications we've made in terms of actual cases uh, since uh, 2000. Let me just kind of wind this down and uh, uh, close the, the monologue portion here and leave a few minutes we can talk about whatever you might be interested in. But uh, let me mention a couple of more things. Number one, uh, there has been, in addition to our enforcement actions, there has been litigation testing our statutes since 2000. Uh, Legan, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court case in the late 90s, which uh, ultimately said that the rule of reason is uh, part of federal antitrust law. And for the smart people in the room, I'll leave it to define the rule of reason from my vantage point. It just means courts look at these one by one and decide is it reasonable or not uh, the imposition of uh, a trade in the marketplace. Others would articulate it with more precision, but I think it really kind of boils down to that as opposed to a more per se or bright line approach to, for example, prohibiting passwords in all these forms. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court said under federal law in the late 90s that uh, rule of reason is the thing. Uh, Kansas had a provision which existed back in the 100-year-old version of our statutes. It was preserved in the 2000 amendments uh, that expressly uh, uh, preserved the idea of a per se prohibition on price fixing in particular. It was unlawful uh, uh, to fix prices in Kansas. In fact, I used that phrase in my testimony in support of the legislation in 2000, which was pointed to in the Kansas Supreme Court version of the legal case. Uh, they brought a state case, uh, um, uh, private actors, uh, testing that. And the Attorney General's office at the time took the position that Kansas remained a per se state, not a rule of reason state. Uh, a majority on the Kansas Supreme Court agreed with that, and that was the holding in the uh, legal case at the Kansas level. Uh, but a majority in the Kansas legislature and the governor did not agree that that is what should be the law, even if it was. And so we got Deegan decided in, I think it was 2010 or 11, I can't remember exactly, the state case. And uh, maybe it was 2012, actually. I think it was 2012 because it was right at the end of the legislative session. There were immediately bills introduced to functionally reverse that state Supreme Court decision. Clock ran out on that legislative session. Along came 2013. There had been a year for the players to work on it. There were a bunch of bills introduced, including a couple that would have just repealed all the Kansas antitrust statutes and said state shouldn't be in this business. Um, but what ultimately passed were the 2013 amendments, the only other substantial amendments to the Kansas antitrust laws. Uh, so you've got the pre-1923 pre stuff, you've got the 2000 amendments, and you've got the 2013 amendments. The 2013 amendments made a variety of changes, but essentially imposed a rule of reason and tethered Kansas law uh, for judicial construction purposes federal interpretations of federal law. Um, and one of the things I just love, uh, in an ironic sort of sense, the entire motivation for the 2000 amendments was discontent in the uh, livestock industry, um, particularly proposals to enact a state-level Packers and Stockyards Act, which deals with how the packing houses deal with producers of cattle. In the 2013 amendments, there were industry sectors that the legislature expressly excluded from the coverage of the Kansas antitrust law, including anybody regulated under the Federal Packers and Stockyards Act. So it was a 180 degree turnaround in public policy. The motivation for the 2000 amendments was the beef industry, and it, by 2013, the beef industry got themselves carved out uh, almost entirely of the Kansas law. It just shows how things change uh, over time. I will leave it at that. Um, Thanks for letting me talk about all that stuff. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Anything you would particularly like to talk about on the antitrust side or the Kansas side? And I didn't mention one of them because I'm saving it in my hip pocket in case. Uh, oh, semester and um, of course we love to rip on Kansas and um, the last time I taught antitrust uh, 
Legion was had been overruled at the state level under the you know uh, Kansas Antitrust Act and didn't, didn't follow the Legion case and so I like to point to that to my students as how backward Kansas is and uh, so I was really personally a little bit disheartened to see that uh, the legislature had stepped up and and uh, restored rule of reason <laughs> treatment to, to resale price made. so Kansas is moving in the right direction. Um, just a compliment on that. It's hard to be against reason. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anything else? No. I found the New York Times area is kind of interesting how you picked up on the subtleties. Do all inquiries sort of start that way, or is there a formal mechanism to get these types of things rolling? There's a lot of different ways that any enforcement action can start, not just in the antitrust context, but let's talk about that one. And sometimes you get an individual complaint literally physically file a complaint with the Office of the Kansas Attorney General saying, I think the antitrust law has been violated. Here's what I know about it. Take a look at it. We take those cases, or we take those complaints. Uh, sometimes it would come to us through some other state. We don't know how they originally got onto it, but they got onto it. They call us up and they say, we're concerned about this. What do you think? Is there an interest? And we start working together, or we take an independent look at it. So that happens with some frequency. Sometimes it comes from a random source. I mean, the example with Connecticut, I think, is a good one. Um, uh, often it comes from a disadvantaged competitor. That is a very frequent place that complaints come from anywhere in the business regulation context, uh, but that's not, uh, uh, antitrust is not excluded from that. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, something I think, this is a much broader comment than just antitrust, but something I think gets lost uh, sometimes, if you're in the enforcement business, the, the law enforcement business, and by that I mean the writ large, not just, you know, criminal law enforcement, Enforcing laws, there is always more supply than there is um, uh, capacity of stuff you could be looking at. So you know, it, it's not as clean as I always thought it was when I was, you know, in law school. When we do some analysis, we figure out our highest priority for enforcement is we go there, we do that. And, you know, it, it's, it's like this is what I've got in front of me, and I'm going to deal with it because the law authorizes and requires me to deal with it. And I don't have time to think about is it the thing I ought to be most focused on right now, generally speaking, there are of course exceptions. Um, and so it's not unusual that you know a matter lands in our inbox in a sort of random manner like that. Yeah. Did you have something also back there? Oh, me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so given when you join other states, how do you handle the investigative aspects of that? Um, and what happens if maybe interests don't align with fellow? Yeah, it does happen. Uh, we do a lot of uh, multi-state enforcement work, again, not just in the uh, antitrust area, although most of our enforcement in antitrust is multi-state. Um, you know, you've got to have some flexibility, because no two states are identical, even in a particular case. They're just not. I mean, sometimes Missouri's just wrong, and so you've got <laughs> you know, you to have some flexibility in order to, to bridge those gaps. Uh, a lot of times, in what I'll call business enforcement work, you know, where the folks on the other side are, are, are marketplace participants, as they almost always are in an antitrust case, um, you know, they, they tend to be fairly sophisticated actors. They tend to have an interest, particularly if they know they have exposure, they, they tend toward desiring global resolution. So, you know, you've got folks on the other side that aren't particularly interested in exploiting all the finities they could to split up a, a group of plaintiff states because they want everybody to settle at once. And that's very helpful. Uh, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get folks on the other side that want to fight for the last dog, and when they do, there can be problems that arise, for example, the sharing of information uh, among states. States have different privilege rules that uh, <coughs> allow, you know, some can share more freely than others without uh, breaching privilege or maintaining confidentiality. You have open record statutes that are different from state to state, so, you know, something that you obtain uh, in confidence in the course of an investigation in state A, if it's shared with state B, might be compelled by judicial process to be released to anybody that asks for it which, you know, people often think of the press asking for it, but usually it's litigants on the other side that ask for it first, which is how it gets to the press. And so um, you're exactly right to be asking those questions. In the real world, at least as I've seen it, that's why they don't arise and get litigated more often, because it often is an interest in global resolution. Anyone else? Um, how great a role do you think publicity plays in whether or not a company's subject, uh, subjective 
all this and we decide whether or not things are investigated, or are investigations always happening and then they become publicized? Uh, it happens both directions. Uh, out of the cases I held up as examples of public enforcement actions in Kansas post-2010, you know, a handful of those, you know, you mentioned one, Facebook, Google, they've been in the headlines, and, and obviously an investigation came after the headlines did. Now, whether there were already action matters happening before the headlines is a different discussion. Uh, we'll talk about at this point. But, um, but a lot of those didn't. I mean, a lot of those only became headlines after there was an enforcement action, um, and maybe after the enforcement action was complete, depending on. So it does happen both ways. I will tell you, this is just my, you know, I want to share with you my view on it. I much prefer the cases where the investigation and enforcement come before the headlines. Because if you don't do that, in addition to all the other issues that arise, and you can imagine what they are, but you almost always get the argument uh, as part of what are hopefully settled discussions with the other side that, you know, your motivations are ill. And, um, while that doesn't make that a true argument, it makes it something you have to deal with if the headline came first and then the investigation. So I much prefer it the other way around, which makes some of my friends in the press unhappy because, of course, they, you know, that's another you know, thing you struggle with as a public enforcer that you don't struggle with so much in a private enforcement action. I mean, we are public agencies. We're subject to open government laws, and should be. We're supposed to be transparent. At the same time, we're a legal shop. There's stuff we cannot share. And you know, getting that balance correct is there's no right line answer to it. We're always sort of struggling. So if we're if we're erring on the side of we don't want any more publicity than we have to, maybe in fairness to the investigated party, or maybe just because it's going to make settlement more difficult, this becomes a headline issue. As soon as that's discovered, our friends in the press are very unhappy because now we're working in secrecy. If on the other hand we're keeping our friends in the press happy because we're keeping them as informed as the rules of ethics allow us to. Now we've got this other set of issues over here that complicates our settlement discussions because it's in the headlines. I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you it's a dynamic that, you know, it's real. So, it's a great question. Well, I would love to keep the man here all day, but there's somebody else just as good who's going to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.